So what I'm going to talk to you a bit about today in the next 20 minutes is the subject of the management of climate change impacts on cultural heritage. And I'm really talking about built heritage and archaeology here, um, with emphasis on the need for sustainable solutions. Um, I'm working here at the University of Lincoln since September in the Conservation Department, which is part of the School of History and Heritage. The research I'm presenting I carried out for my doctoral um, research at the Dublin Institute of Technology. So uh, the presentation is divided into four parts. A short background, I'm going to talk to you about some interviews I did with people working in the field, uh, look at three case studies and then summary and conclusion. So first of all, climate change. Uh, you're familiar with the term, but maybe not so much with the definition. Climate change is defined as a change in the average climate or its variability from one averaging period to the next. And it's this averaging period that I want to draw your attention to because um, climate change is measured in what climatologists refer to as the climate norm, which is a period of 30 years or longer. Um, so it's not possible to point to individual events like the recent floods and say that's climate change because climate change can only be seen over this long-term period. And that's why sustainability is such an issue when it comes to um, adapting and managing climate change because um, we need to take this long-term view. So what can we expect? Um, there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of what the future climate change is going to look like not least because of the many unknown um, variables and also the climate models themselves don't always agree. But in general we can say for the UK we're going to get um, warmer, wetter winters, hotter, drier summers, an increase in the frequency of extreme and unpredictable weather. So the patterns we're used to are going to change um, and while the annual rainfall volume might be the same, the way it falls is going to be different. So you're going to get more potentially more um, short, intense bursts of rainfall that could be associated with high winds and that has a lot of knock-on effects for the landscape and the built heritage environment. Also sea level rise with coastal flooding, coastal erosion and so on. So um, how can you understand the implications of climate change for cultural heritage? Well it's a very complicated picture. You've got a number of different climatic factors, they interact in different ways to produce different impacts on different heritage values. So really the best way to get uh, a grasp on this is to look at um, individual site level assessments um, because otherwise it's, it's just a very confusing picture and these are only a few of the potential impacts that you might be thinking about. Okay, first section over. So. Um, when I was doing the research, I wanted to find out what people were doing in the area. It's a reasonably new, air, new area of research um, and work in, within cultural heritage. So I spoke to 30 people who are either researching or working in the field related to specifically climate change and cultural heritage. Um, so I, I talked to 30 people from 15 different countries, so quite a wide perspective. Um, I asked them a number of questions. I'm not going to go through them all here. I'm just going to highlight a few which I think are interesting. Um, so firstly, I asked them if they'd assess the vulnerability of cultural heritage to climate change. Unsurprisingly, probably because they were sampled for that reason, 70% of them had done so. So then I asked them if in those assessments they'd noted impacts on cultural heritage which they attributed to climate change. And here, 55% um, of them said yes, they had. And they were, um, a lot of them were in polar or subpolar regions or coastal regions. Those were kind of the, the key impacts that were coming up at the time. But more interestingly, of those who said that no, they hadn't or that they were unsure, a lot of them went on then to point to impacts which they felt were associated with climate change but they felt it was either too soon to say that or that they didn't have enough data. So this comes back to this um, issue that it can be quite difficult to determine whether the observed impacts um, can be reliably attributed to climate change. Firstly, because of this long-term nature of the data set that you need. And secondly, because there's a lot of other environmental actors which could be causing um, 
the effect that you're seeing. So this is an issue that comes up again. We'll talk about it further in the presentation. So another question I asked them was how important they felt on-site monitoring was to understanding the impacts of climate change. And they were to rank it between one of no importance to seven of, yes, the highest importance. So as you can see, most of them felt it was very important, scored either six or seven, with only one person putting it in the middle of the scale. Um, and they thought it was important for several reasons. First of all, to understand what's going on at the site. Second of all, so that they could then um, uh, develop appropriate adaptation strategies which were targeted at the main problems. And lastly, they felt that it would help them to secure resources. So they wanted the data so that they could convince, convince funders and politicians of the need to fund the actions that they wanted to take. What's interesting then is I went on to ask them, well, if it's so important, do you know of any monitoring tools which are actually designed to function over the period that's necessary to look at climate change impacts? And interestingly, about 55% of them said, well, no, actually, we don't. So there's a big gap here between what people think is important and what they think is currently possible. Um, in the context of today, um, one of the respondents said, who said no went on to say that while he didn't know of any technological solutions that could last that long, um, his solution was to use um, monitors which were cheap and easily replaceable but to embed the process within a civil society structure which he felt was stable and sustainable. So in his case he was using university students, his monitoring was embedded within their course and he felt that going forward even though the equipment itself would have to be changed, um, the fact that it was within a sort of a stable um, human resources element meant that it was sustainable. So it's a slightly different approach and again it's this community aspect. Okay, so the case studies. I'm going to talk to you today about three uh, projects which I looked at which were approaching the issue of climate change and cultural heritage from kind of different aspects. Um, one's in Northern Ireland, one in Scotland and one in Sweden. So the first one in Northern Ireland was a joint project between Queen's University in Belfast and Oxford University. And they're looking at um, understanding the impacts on stone deterioration of increased rainfall and increased time of wetness and this more severe heavy rain. Specifically looking at um, increased microbiological growth on the stone and increased salt damage. So they constructed this little test hut with um, test walls that they built different types of stone. You can see them in the picture. And they also were monitoring, they were monitoring the atmospheric climate at the site. And they were also uh, monitoring the uh, moisture within the stone. And what their, their results showed was that actually um, aspect and orientation of the walls was just as important as the actual climate which they'd recorded at the site for these kinds of deterioration. So this again points to the fact that a site-based analysis is vital to really understanding the potential impacts of climate change. Um, another project which I visited is some of you may be familiar with. It's um, called SCAPE and it's run by Tom Dawson out of St Andrews in Scotland. Um, SCAPE was established in 1996 to manage the coastal zone assessment surveys of archaeological resources. So they basically surveyed the heritage on the coast of Scotland and by 2012 they would completed about 40% of the Scottish coastline which when you include all the islands and everything is an extremely long coastline. Um, and at that point um, they were deciding that they were going to move away from the continuous survey to actually taking action on sites which they'd identified as being at risk. Um, and I'll let Tom explain it to you. He said to me, um, the simplest thing is to carry on doing surveys, making lists, making priorities, but if you don't actually do anything, by the time you get finished, the sites on your priority list will be washed away. Um, and this is him at Bodin Lime Kiln, which actually is being washed away. Um, but SCAPE have done a 3D laser scanning of the building, so that's um, 
preservation by documentation or preservation by record. SCAPE um, have also helped to establish Shorewatch, which is a community archaeology project. And here they're using um, community archaeology groups to, it started out using community archaeology groups to monitor coastal heritage. But after a while, they realized that open-ended monitoring was actually becoming quite a negative experience because the volunteers were monitoring sites, they were reporting damage, they were reporting loss, and then one day they went along and the site was gone and no one had done anything with all the information that they'd gathered. So um, it was actually becoming counterproductive. So SCAPE have now moved more towards doing some monitoring, but also targeted actions. So recording of site, excavation of site, and occasionally even restoration of the sites. So this idea that open-ended monitoring is actually not a good idea. You know, there has to be a, a action at the end of it. So um, the last case study then, I'm not going to try and pronounce the Swedish, but it translates as um, runic inscriptions as cultural and natural environmental indicators. So this is looking at the inscriptions on rune stones, and there's um, a lot of rune stones dotted around particularly the southern area of Sweden, and many of them are either in or near their original positions. Many of them also are documented going back to the 1700s, so there's a very long um, documentation record of these stones, and more recently also they have a system in Sweden which is called rune wardens. So these are volunteers within the community who look after one or two runes which are near them and um, they keep an eye on them and they send periodic reports into the National Heritage Board on the rune stones. So they're very well documented and the idea of the project is first of all to look at the, the documentation and to try to come up with a, a rate of deterioration for the stones based on um, the runes themselves and whether, how legible they are over the, the years. Um, of course, again, this is the problem of causality. You can see the rate of deterioration, but what's the cause of deterioration? And when I was there, that was the thing that the project were trying to get to grips with, how they could disentangle um, causality for the deterioration that they were seeing. Um, the project itself, using runestones as environmental indicators, was first initiated in the 1980s to address air pollution. Um, but over the years, it went through several hiatuses and then was dropped completely because of, first of all, staff changes. Then the, the National Heritage Board actually moved from um, Stockholm to Visby. Um, and then there was a lack of political interest, so resources fell away. Um, and then in 2012, it was reignited because all of a sudden the political interest had moved from indicators for air pollution to indicators for climate change. So now the project's being... Uh, reinvented and they're trying to see how they can address the use of rune stones as indicators for climate change. But it's quite a good illustration of the problems in setting up and maintaining a long-term monitoring project, a lot of logistical and practical issues which come into the picture. Okay, so near the end. So equifinality. This is actually what I've been talking about, that the same effect could be attributable to different events or processes. One way you can do this is the kind of ostrich effect. So you say, well, I don't really care what's causing it, I'm just going to seek to manage the impact. And yes, of course, I think it's important that we take action now. We can't wait 30 years to be sure we're talking about climate change. But at the same time, if you really want targeted and appropriate management and adaptation strategies, it's much better if you know what you're dealing with. So I would still say that um, long-term monitoring is very important. Of course, as I already mentioned, monitoring is not an end in itself. It, it, it has to feed into management response. Otherwise, it can be at best a waste of resources and at worst, it can be counterproductive and lead to negative um, emotions within the people who are undertaking it and in the funding body they won't want to fund you again if they you know they think nothing's happened. Um, we need to develop um, sustainable monitoring solutions there's a lack of those there's also a lack of tested adaptation solutions 
And because of the uncertainty, it's really important that as well as the solutions being sustainable, they need to be flexible because we are really not sure what's going to happen in the future. And I think I've tried to show a few instances where community involvement has a lot of potential in terms of developing these strategies, and I think that's an area where there's scope. Um, so finally, I think we need to prepare for hard decisions. It's not going to be possible to save everything, particularly in the coastal areas. There's going to be a lot of loss. And we need to be strategic about how we manage that loss and so that we don't actually end up wasting resources. Um, on occasion, you know, heroic measures may need to be taken for the very rare site. This is Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. It was in danger of... Um, being washed away by the sea, so it was moved half a mile inland at a cost of $11.8 million, and that was in 1999. Um, it's quite controversial. It's possible that in about 50 years it's going to be under threat again because of sea level rise. So, conclusion then. Um, climate change will, and probably already is, impacting on cultural heritage. Um, we need to develop long-term sustainable strategies both for monitoring and adapting to climate change and I think there's a lot of scope for community-based solutions here. Um, thanks to all the interviewees and case study people and people who funded me um, and thanks to you for listening. <laughs>